Good morning. Welcome to Ask the Geriatrician. This is our second webcast. We want to thank Bab Baptist Health Foundation of San Antonio, who's been one of our very uh, supportive donors. We also want to thank Methodist Healthcare Ministries Foundation, the San Antonio Area Foundation, Prior Trust, and the many other organizations and individuals who sponsored this, this program and support mmlearn.org. Okay, if you're watching at home or you're watching with a group, you can make a comment or ask a question. If you look on your computer, you're going to see a bubble, and it looks like this. I think of it as a comic bubble. And it's um, at the top of the presentation screen. If you click on that, you can type your comment out or your uh, question and send it to us and then we'll be able to give it to our presenter today, Dr. Weiss. You can also phone in a question if you would like and you can do that by calling 264-7000, the area code is 210, 210-264-7000, that's only for today. Now I want to introduce Dr. Thomas Weiss. I heard him speak last month. I also got to hear him speak this week uh, on substance abuse and depression among uh, elderly individuals. You're going to really love him. He has a lot of important information to share with you. So please help me welcome Dr. Thomas Weiss. Thank you, Nancy. I'll keep sending you the $50 on a regular basis. So uh, I, I mentioned this last month that I was trained by a Jesuit priest, and they always insist in their trainees that whenever you do a presentation, you have to tell a story and introduce pieces of history. So I'm actually going to tell a very short, real story. My, my older sister, and I always teasingly refer to her as my much older sister, she's the grandmother of nine children in Chicago. And she called me uh, a couple months back and she said, you know, one of my grandsons is in the second grade and he, want, he has a project. He has to write about a living legend and he chose me, his grandmother. And uh, he's going to ask me a number of questions about what it was like when I was eight years old growing up in Chicago. And, and my sister said that she was kind of regaling him with uh, how it was when she was eight years old growing up, the, the toys she played with and the games she, uh, you know, had. And then it struck her. She remembered polio. And, you know, I barely remember polio, but I'll just remind all of us that it was a scourge in this country. Um, children in particular were stricken. They either died or were paralyzed. It was the era of the, quote, iron lung. I remember I was very young, but we weren't allowed. They closed the city swimming pool, and a lot of kids stayed in. It was a time of quarantine. And, you know, those of us that have some gray hair remember polio. Of course, to 20-year-olds, it's sort of a great mystery and part of the past. But I want you to think about what happened to polio in this country. We began to turn our attention to it scientifically, and we began to dissect this illness. And thanks to, uh, I think, Dr. Sabin, we all rolled up our sleeves. Dr. Salk, forgive me. We got inoculated with the vaccine, and then Dr. Sabin improved it to an oral vaccine. And now, 60 years later, polio is vanquished. Okay? So I, I want to use that as a, a model of hope. I'm not trying to make false promises, uh, but I think that's sort of the destination and intention that we seek with dementia. So that's going to be my little opening story so I don't get hit by a Jesuit lightning bolt. Oops, I'm kind of computer illiterate. There we go. Now I'm, I'm an ambitious guy, so in a half hour we're going to cover all this? Well, well we'll see. Uh, we'll give it the best we can. Now remember the Jesuits stress telling stories and doing history, so we'll go way back into... 
we'll go right back into the Bible. So this is a book in the Bible, the book of Sirach. I actually heard this during an Advent uh, homily, and I was sort of stricken in my pew. And this is uh, the biblical directions for how we care for people with Alzheimer's disease, isn't it? My sons, take care of your father when he is old. Grieve him not as long as he lives. Even if his mind fail, be consoling to him. Revile him not. Kindness to a father will not be forgotten. So 2,000 years ago, we got our marching orders, eh? So now let me take you up to the 20th century. This is the first indexed documented case of Alzheimer's disease. A woman, 51-year-old German woman named Auguste D., and she was cared for for four consecutive years by Alwa Alzheimer in a German hospital. And as you can see, she was admitted in 1902. He took care of her for four years. She passed. Dr. Alzheimer was not only a psychiatrist, he was also a pathologist, so he autopsied her. He autopsied her brain, and he drew impeccable, meticulous pen and ink drawings of the two brain uh, or the two abnormal uh, hallmarks of Alzheimer's dementia. They're called senile plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. And then he decided to write the case up and present it to his physician colleagues at a meeting. And as you can see at the end, he called it a curious disease of the cortex. At the end of his presentation, Silence, no questions, no comments. So look at the chief complaint of Auguste D. when she was admitted into the German hospital in 1902. It really is poignant, and I think it, it, it says everything. I have lost myself. And there are her presenting symptoms at time of admission. Abysmal memory, language problems, extreme confusion, immense paranoia, quite negative, wandering. And back then in 1902 through 1906, German hospitals were actually kind of impressive. She was treated with a very stringent and, and healthy diet, particularly compared to the diets we consume in 2010 in this country. Uh, very active. You know those Germans. They like to make sure you get out and exercise. She had a full body massage every day. How magnificent, eh? She received balneotherapy, which is taking of therapeutic baths, still done in Eastern Europe, as you know. And then didn't have very many medicines in 1906. When she didn't sleep, they treated her with either alcohol or chlorohydrate. So this was history, eh? And a little more. Here's a picture of Elwa Alzheimer. And there's the story that we just recounted. And then, of course, when he did the autopsy, what he saw, the hallmarks of this disease, abnormal depositions of proteins. One abnormal deposition, the senile plaques, they were outside the neurons. And the other abnormal deposition, the neurofibrillary tangles, they were inside the neurons. And Oops, let's see here. Good golly, I'm way off. Uh, and there's a little picture of them. On the top is a picture of the... Uh, Senile plaques, these are uh, micro microscopic pictures, and then on the bottom are the neurofibrillary tangles. We think these are the culprits of the disease. Patients that don't have Alzheimer's dementia don't have uh, tremendous accumulations of these abnormal proteins. So in the most simplest fashion, Alzheimer's dementia is a disease of, of proteins gone wrong. Okay? Oh, boy, I'm just having a heck of a time. Ah, here's more of an expanded history. So in 1906, here's the case report, you know, a little more than a century ago. And then, as you can see, there was a long period of absolutely nothing, okay? Because we had bigger fish to fry. We had to treat infections, and we had to take care of tuberculosis. But in the 1950s, you know, what had come to pass? Well, we had vaccines. People were beginning to live longer. Remember that in 1900... The average life expectancy in this country was around 47. Now in 2000, the average life expectancy is 77. 
So we've added three decades with vaccines and antibiotics. So in the 1950s, people were beginning to live longer and we were beginning to see changes. And we talked about a condition called senile dementia. And then in the 1970s, some doctors were starting to beat the tam-tam drums about a coming epidemic. Um, and we discovered that there was a deficit in the brain of a particular neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And then in the 1980s, we started to really zero in on this illness and look at those plaques and tangles, and we noted that it had a particular pathology called amyloid pathology, and we actually started to see it run in families. So we knew there was a gen genetic influence. So it's a bit like a, a jigsaw puzzle, eh? The pieces are starting to be assembled, but the picture isn't there. And then in the 1990s, the... The research engine is working a little faster, and we start to introduce some treatments, and we'll talk about that. We begin to identify other types of dementia besides Alzheimer's dementia. We begin to talk about a precursor disease called MCI. This may be, we think, the pre-disease state before Alzheimer's dementia, just like with hypertension, we think there's a pre hypertensive state with diabetes. We think there's a pre-diabetic state. And that's important because in medicine, if we can identify those people who are at earliest risk and we can intervene with treatments, maybe we can change the course of the disease. And then lastly, we start to kind of get full of ourselves, as human beings do. We actually start to believe that maybe we can actually modify this disease by interfering, you see a, a kind of an abbreviation there, forgive me, APP, that's called amyloid precursor protein, which we think is where this disease starts to, to abnormally misfold those protein culprits, okay? So we begin to actually start to envision that maybe we can decrease the production of these bad proteins or maybe we can increase the clearance of these bad proteins. So that's kind of the, the short history, okay? Now, you know, the Jesuits insist that I have to define things, or again, I'll be hit by that lightning bolt. So this is the definition of Alzheimer's disease medically or psychiatrically. You know, most of us joke about Alzheimer's dementia, you know, as it's a memory disease, and it is. That's one component, as you can see. So... The first order of business in that first paragraph is Alzheimer's dementia is defined as chronic memory impairment. Chronic is more than six months, okay? So it's not like when we're worried sick about our children and our memory misfires for a day or two. This is persistent memory impairment. And then one of the following four other symptoms, aphasia, apraxia, agnosia, those are fancy medical terms for problems with language, you know, finding the right words. Um, apraxia, problems with execution of movements, if you will, dressing, putting on a seatbelt, and agnosia, you know, recognizing, recognizing things, recognizing places, recognizing people. But by far the biggest capture area in those four symptoms is the last one, disturbance in executive functioning, which is fancy lingo for being able to plan, sequence, make decisions, adjust when things go haywire. And, you know, you do this unconsciously, automatically, every day when you make a telephone call, set the microwave, follow a recipe, drive to a destination. But folks with this disease have enormous difficulties. And then, of course, there's some other conditions there that kind of tell us what's not Alzheimer's dementia. You know, this must be a gradual course, not an abrupt course that speaks to a different type of disease, and then these symptoms can't be due to another central nervous system uh, insult, if you will, like a, a toxic ingestion or substances. So there's our definition. Now, this is a, the good old pie chart. Dementia as an umbrella diagnosis simply means progressive degeneration in the central nervous system of cognition. So that's sort of the umbrella term. Um, but underneath dementia is an umbrella term are a number of different types of dementia of which we think the lion's share, that light blue 
uh, shading is Alzheimer's dementia. Uh, probably the second most common, maybe 15 to 20 percent, is something called vascular dementia. This is, uh, has a much different course than Alzheimer's dementia. Then there is some mixture in the light green between vascular dementia and Alzheimer's dementia. In, uh, and then we have in the, I guess, the, the burnt orange of University of Texas, we have a, yet another type of dementia called Lewy body dementia that we think is associated with Parkinson's disease. And then those very skinny fragments are, are, uh, are very rare, but, but very virulent, very rapidly progressive dementias, uh, frontal lobe, uh, Pick's disease, temporal, uh, frontotemporal dementia, and then in the light green, some reversible dementias that are very rare, you know, metabolic disturbances, vitamin deficiencies, thyroid disease, uh, infectious dementias. But by far the lion's share is Alzheimer's dementia. Now here's a little forecast, although this is exceedingly dated. As you can see on the bottom, this, this slide was produced in 2003, and uh, Actually, as we sit here today in 2010, we've got 5.5 million people with this disease in the United States. And you can see the projections as, uh, as our society ages and as America grays, this is just going to accelerate through the roof. And actually, you can probably push uh, those pie graphs to the left, if you will, as you look at them, because you know, we're anticipating probably by 2035 that we'll have 14 or 15 million people with the disease in this country. And, uh, you know, we just uh, on Sunday had this landmark legislation for health care. Well, as this disease triples, you can, uh, I think Congress is going to have to stay in session permanently to try and figure out how to just simply pay for taking care of patients with this disease as it progresses. And, you know, this is a little demoralizing, but also a little inspiring all at the same time. What this projects is that uh, on the, the horizontal curve, you see patients as we stage this illness, mild Alzheimer's dementia, moderate and severe. Um, what we see is its, its prevalence in, in red. It's, uh, who, you know, who has the disease and then who's actually been diagnosed. So it tells us that there's a fair amount of people that still await diagnosis, and then to really make our, our, uh, our chins drop, who's been treated, and you basically see a decline. Who has it, who's diagnosed, who's treated. So this is a, a clarion call in my mind to physicians and clinicians to screen for this illness, diagnose it as early as you can, and then get to treatment as early as you can. We can do much, much better here. And I think the wheel is turning, and I think we're moving in that direction. So this is uh, what I call the slippery slope slide. kind of reminds me of the slide I used to go down when I was a kid. So on the, the horizontal axis are, are years from diagnosis. We think roughly from diagnosis to death in most patients with Alzheimer's dementia is about 8 to 12 years. And then on the vertical axis is something called the, the min, mini mental status exam. This is something that clinicians do in their office. It's a quick screen of cognition and memory and attention and concentration and naming, all those symptoms we talked about earlier. And it kind of gives us a, a very quick look as to how, how unwell the patient is. Are they mild? Are they moderate? Are they severe? And, and simply put, 25 to 30 is, quote, normal. 17 to 24 is mild. 10 to 17 is moderate. And less than 10 is uh, severe. So what we see here, if we follow that, that uh, slippery slope, is as the disease begins, you know, people are, still have capacity. Their memory is failing them. But then as, uh, as the disease starts to progress over the years, roughly about every three years, they shift from mild and then three years later to moderate and then three years later to severe. And right around a mini mental status exam of 15, if you will, is when many other symptoms are now starting to emerge because the patient's short-term memory is almost dissolved. 
their ability to learn is extremely impaired. And life, as it comes at us very fast, becomes quite terrifying and confusing. And that's when patients wander, and that's when patients have hallucinations and delusions and their behavior changes. And that's often when they require lots and lots of help. Um, often more than one soul can provide 24-7 for 8 to 12 years, and that's often when placement begins to be considered. And, and you know, right with that, this is uh, the same sort of thing, although just to keep you on your toes, I've switched the axis. So the mini mental status exam is now in the horizontal axis and what we, we call activities of daily living. You know, all the things we do unthinkingly, you know, we woke up this morning, we, uh, we toileted, we groomed, we dressed, we drove to work, we made decisions, we carried on, we came home, we operated lots of equipment, lots of instruments, and, and it was easy as pie. But now you have no short-term memory, you're not able to learn, you're not able to adopt. All these things as the disease progresses become increasingly more difficult, if not impossible, to do until at the tail end when people have the severe stage of this disease, even the elemental activities of eating, sleeping, toileting become profound. So this is uh, the disease, so we sure better do something about it. And uh, this is where we're at uh, as of 2010. Well, first things first, who's at risk? And we're now starting to assemble a genetic picture. For about mm, almost 15 years now, we've known about one gene called apolipoprotein allele E4. I can only say that once a day, so don't test me. And we think this gene is found in about 15% of uh, this population in, a, in our country. And we think that if you're homozygous for two of the, uh, for the E4 allele, you're at a three times increased risk for having this illness. So we can actually draw a, a specimen of blood and measure apolipoprotein, I have said it twice, allele E4, and, and, and this will give us a very tiny idea about those patients who, who might be at greater risk than someone that doesn't have this gene. And then three years ago, the smart people at Columbia University found another gene. It's called Sorrel-1. This, this is found in about another 15 to 20 percent of the population. And this also confers increased risk. And we can draw this uh, blood specimen and, and then assemble, you know, now we've got about 40 percent of the population that we think has increased risk. Now, simple for me to say, each of these blood draws costs about 300 bucks. Insurance will not pay for it. And, of course, if insurance did pay for it, they'd then target you as having pre-existing disease and they would yank, yank your insurance. But that's a, a, a political piece. But we are assembling the genetic components of this disease, and I'd like to fantasize that in the distant future, maybe as we see our primary care doctor when we're 40 or 50, he'll draw our blood and he'll give us sort of a risk picture like he does, he or she does now, with lipids and cholesterol and heart disease. So that's coming. Imaging. Well, you know, when I trained with Hippocrates, we were very excited to have a CAT scan. Um, now, you know, that's a low technology. So high technology is MRIs and even higher technology is something called a PET, a positron emission tomography study. And the very smart people at the University of Pittsburgh have come up with a radioactive tracer that's injected intravenously and it actually tags on to some of those bad proteins we talked about earlier, the, the amyloid proteins. And we can then slide a patient into a positron emission tomography scanner and with this compound B, that's PIB, University of Pittsburgh, compound B tracer, we can stage with great specificity where the patient is with Alzheimer's disease, we can even look at the accumulation of these amyloid proteins. And you say, this is absolutely magnificent, and it is. It's only $25,000 a pop. So this is beyond any of our reaches clinically in the trenches, but time will pass. Uh, the price and cost will come down, and, 
Uh, quite simply, we have a technology now that allows us to image and stage the disease. We just have to make it available. Wouldn't it be lovely if we could have a biomarker? We have biomarkers for many diseases like diabetes. You have a fasting blood sugar. You have a hemoglobin A1C. Biomarker for rheumatoid arthritis. We are searching for it diligently. We do have a biomarker. It exists for Alzheimer's dementia. The trouble is it's cerebral spinal fluid. And in order to obtain that specimen, the patient has to agree to have a lumbar puncture. And this is not done easily or smoothly in the office or by a phlebotomist, but it does allow us some predictive measures. So currently the hunt is on for a biomarker where we can simply draw a specimen of blood, but we don't have anything with, with good specificity or sensitivity yet, but we're looking, okay? Testing, well, I kind of set you up for this. I talked about a little screen that clinicians do in the office called a mini mental status exam. That's been out for 38 years now, so we've, we've decided to uh, update it, and we have two updates. One is... Uh, the MOCA, this is the Montreal Objective Cognitive Assessment Test. We think it's uh, more specific, more sensitive. Uh, I think as time passes, it will replace the mini mental status exam. And then we have yet another instrument, the St. Louis University Mental Status Exam, but they have to rename it. We don't want to ask for the slums test. This is also quicker, more sensitive, more specific. Uh, we'll see which one uh, uh, takes precedence, but this allows clinicians, you know, faster, more sensitive in-office memory screen. And then lastly, we're, we're just now beginning to, to refine and, and understand that pre-disease state, uh, minimal cognitive impairment. There's a, a number of types, but we think the patients that have amnestic type MCI, those are at greatest risk to convert to Alzheimer's dementia on a, on a number of about 40% with amnestic MCI convert each year to mild Alzheimer's dementia. So, you know, this is looking at the disease before it starts to get momentum, and this is where research is starting to really crank out. Um, here's some examples. Uh, on the left is an MRI, and, you know, MRIs... Uh, give us greater resolution of anatomy three-dimensionally. And what this MRI shows us is a patient with, you know, severe atrophy of uh, brain tissue. And then the PET scan actually looks at uptake of glucose. You know, even though this uh, brain only weighs three or four pounds, it takes up uh, almost 20, 25 percent of our glucose metabolism because it needs a lot of fuel to do all it does. And what we see with the PET scan is... Uh, you know, cool areas and hot areas, particularly where we know the disease lives. Uh, here's uh, those positron emission studies, and again, you can see very clearly on the left are normal brains, and on the right, early and late Alzheimer's, and if you will, the brain cools off translation less and less and less uptake of glucose as the brain is essentially dying, if you will. And here's compound B. We have a control on the right and Alzheimer's patients on the left, uh, and, you know, they've done it in different uh, sections, and, again, it allows us to, to stage this illness very precisely. So stay tuned for more on compound B. Now, uh, you know, so those are the, the research tools that really aren't within our grasp day-to-day -day in our doctor's office. So this is what the doctor does to evaluate patients, you know, uh, take a history, what doctors do, take a history, do an exam, you know, very uh, little more than just a physical exam, mental status exam, neurological exam, that mini mental status exam we talked about, all sorts of uh, blood work to rule out anything infectious or metabolic, that's de rigueur. And then hopefully, it, I, I wouldn't say optional, I say if the patient has not had an imaging study, that's mandatory to at least have a baseline imaging study. And then for those folks that, that have the resources, neuropsychological testing can be really uh, incredibly helpful in pinpoint precision of where the, the uh, deficits are, although, again, not covered by insurance and often expensive. These are some uh, other 
conditions and illnesses that might mimic and or worsen Alzheimer's disease, and it's the usual suspects, uh, substance abuse, some, you know, depression, metabolic disturbances. If people have hearing and vision losses that aren't compensated for, that doesn't make anybody's day-to-day -day life easier. Uh, con a relatively rare condition, but a, a treatable condition called normal pressure hydrocephalus. Of course, part of the reason we want to get imaging is to make sure what's going on in the central nervous system isn't a hidden tumor or a hidden uh, a blood vessel malformation. And then infection can always be kind of a, a silent but deadly player. And then uh, lastly, uh, again, substance and uh, what atherosclerosis is probably for more uh, peculiar to vascular dementia. Um, these are some tests that, that we use uh, both in nursing home settings and in the office to, to try and get a baseline idea of where the patient is and then we can repeat these downstream in order to follow the course of the patient in a variety of, of different tests to measure memory, to measure day-to-day -day function, activities of daily living, to measure mood, the, the geriatric depression scale, to measure behaviors, the neuropsychiatric inventory. And now, thank goodness, we can actually measure what's afoot with the caregiver upon which this disease is, uh, I, I would put, at minimum, an equivalent, although different type of burden. This is a little example of a mini mental status exam. It uh, takes about five to ten minutes to do uh, 30 odd questions, and again, uh, we talked about the scoring earlier. Uh, this is from a, a, a very renowned geriatric psychiatrist here in San Antonio. This is his invention, Dr. Don Royal, the clocks test. Uh, this is a, another quick screening method that allows us to, if you have one or two minutes with the patient, say uh, somebody that's hospitalized and you're on walk rounds, this allows us to kind of get a a very quick look at the patient's mental status. And then uh, for those clinicians that are really under the wire, this is a, a, an assessment that can be done in about 120 seconds uh, to, to kind of screen for this disease. Uh, these are the activities of daily living that we hopefully measure at the beginning and through the course of this illness because one of the goals of treatment is to try to preserve the patient's independent functioning as long as possible. So uh, hopefully clinicians are not only asking about memory, but please tell me how the patient is doing with eating, uh, walking, uh, toileting, grooming, uh, operating, you know, equipment in the household and, and so forth. Treatment. Well, where are we at in 2010? We have four approved medicines by the FDA. Uh, we have uh, Aricept, that's Tenepazil in the third part. That was the first medicine approved in 1996. We have Exelon, that's Rivastigmine. That was approved in 1999. Uh, Razadine, Galantamine, approved in 2000. And then we have a, a European import, um, Nemenda, Memantine, that was approved in 2003. So all of these drugs have demonstrated to the FDA an effect on Alzheimer's dementia and relative tolerability and safety. Otherwise, they would not have been approved. I mean, the FDA is our watchdog ever since the thalidomide disaster of 1962. Um, so these medicines have been with us. We know they are far from perfect. We know they have side effects. But if you examine the mountain of clinical data on these four drugs, it's clear that they do have an effect. And now the effect differs from patient to patient, but if you look at broad populations of patients that are treated with these medicines versus patients that are untreated, what you'll see is that the treated folks have a slower progression of the illness, the treated folks stay at home longer, the treated folks are more functional longer, and the treated folks have less downstream behavioral problems. That's my belief, and I think the, the scientific data supports it. 
Over the last decade, these medicines have been modified. Galantamine, Razodyne, is now a once-a-day extended release. Exelon, which was a twice-a-day oral medicine, Rivastigmine, is now a patch, so it's absorbed through the skin. That's improved its tolerability tremendously. Aricept and Epizil is now in an oral dissolving tablet, so if the patient has trouble swallowing pills, this simply dissolves on the tongue. And then Nemenda, Mementine, uh, is now in a once-a-day extended release. Um, so, uh, we'll kind of move on here in the interest of time. At the risk of torturing you, I'll just give you a one-minute notion uh, about where we're at with research. So back to those bad proteins, the senile plaques, the neurofibrillary tangles. We know now that, in particular, the senile plaques appear to be the most pathologic, the most problem-causing. And we know how they're born. In a normal brain, every day as we age, we form amyloid precursor protein. And in a normal, healthy brain, where we're not genetically vulnerable, we clip this. This is a very long protein. It's 720-odd components. We normally clip it into short fragments. Okay, And these fragments are dissolved and cleared, and we don't develop abnormal depositions. But in patients that are genetically vulnerable and maybe have some other risk factors, this long protein, APP, is clipped off not in short fragments but long fragments. And these fragments are produced. They begin to accumulate. They're not cleared. They start to consolidate, clump together, if you will, and then they start to transform. And this is where they become problematic and evil because as they transform, it sets up inflammation and slowly but surely it blows holes in the neurons and these lead to symptoms. So the wonder of this, this is sort of a cascade, isn't it? A pathway, eh? So researchers say, hey, if we can intervene at any point along this cascade, maybe we can modify the disease. So right now in drug development, our intention is to try and modify production, accumulation, consolidation. And, and we've got a wide variety of ways to do this. We have um, progress in vaccines that prevent these proteins from even being produced. Okay? The trouble is, so far with these vaccines, they cause considerable side effects. Okay? We're looking at a host of different compounds and molecules that we think protect the neuron. Right. Let me give you six or five developments. We already talked about uh, identifying a new gene, SORL1. Um, so number two, Neurochem is a pharmaceutical company that in 2008 introduced a medicine called Alzamed, which uh, locked on to these bad proteins and kept them from accumulating, kept them from consolidating. And it looked very promising in the trials. However, it did not meet the FDA's standards for effect. And it rose through the, the clinical trial process, but in front of the FDA at the 11th hour, they said, we don't approve it. That was 2008. 2009, uh, another pharmaceutical company out of Salt Lake City had an old drug that they discovered quite serendipitously seemed to take these bad proteins and dissolve them, lower them, both in humans with the disease and in animal models. And it again proceeded through the trials, and in 2009 the FDA deemed that it wasn't effective enough. So we never saw that reach the light of day. And then in 2008 a French company had a compound called Zaloprodin that was very exciting because at least in, uh, in the lab and in animal models, it appeared to protect neurons from all sorts of toxic insults, but it failed miserably in humans. And I say, geez, Weiss, can you demoralize us further? Well, no, we're going to get to, this will be like a Baptist revival. Now we'll start to encourage you. So what are we looking at in 2010? Well, there's two compounds that are exciting. The first one is a, actually a very old medicine formulated in Russia called Dimabond. 
This uh, began its life as an antihistamine, you know, for good old South Texas allergies. But again, quite by, by just the, the hand of God and good fortune, it was discovered to have utility in a, in a dreadful, rare central nervous system disease called Huntington's disorder. And then it was trial in Alzheimer's dementia and it appeared to be very helpful. Uh, it looks like it has multiple ways of working in the brain, but uh, it's quite unique in that it, what it seems to do is boost or enhance the function of mitochondria in the neuron. And mitochondria, to take you back to basic science, that's the, the part of the, the cell that gives energy to the cell. So this is an energy booster and it also protects the mitochondria. So stay tuned for what happens with this drug. It's in front of the FDA right now awaiting approval. And then the last compound is called Rember. This is a very old drug used for malaria called methylene blue. They're using it to stain those bad proteins and lo and behold they discovered that when they stained them they dissolved. So this appears to have some promise. So those are the two newest drugs that are currently being trialed actively. So in conclusion Time is passing. You know, uh, I like this quote because I think it says a lot about those of us that are touched by this, to the, this disease, those of us that are trying to do what we can with the tools we have right now, you know, to choose what is difficult all one's days as if it were easy. That is faith. And then uh, just in conclusion, the future will be different. I wish I could give you a timeline. People say when, where. Uh, I think what we'll see is disease modification and hopefully like polio, disease prevention. Okay, And truly, 2010, we're really still in the infancy of diagnosis and treatment. So I think you should be of good cheer, be encouraged, and most of all, remain hopeful because, you know, what, what's Reader Di Reader's Digest says, laughter is the best medicine. Well, I'm going to say hope is, is a photo finish right behind it. And on that note, I, I better take questions. I see Nancy's got some questions for me. Thank you. Okie doke. So uh, the first one is, is uh, to be expected. Can we prevent dementia or lower our chances of getting it? Well, uh, yes. So I'll give you the good news and the bad news. There are some things that we can do to, to reduce our chances of developing Alzheimer's dementia, and then there are some things that we can't do. So let's, we'll start out on the demoralizing side and then go to the resurrecting side next. So we can't choose our parents. I think when I was a teenager, I probably wanted to choose them, but we can't choose our parents. So we're dealt the genetic cards uh, right now, although it's a little scary being a, an apprentice researcher. I guarantee you there are a lot of um, smart people who are well-funded that, that are very much trying to change our genetics, and I'm not sure whether that's good or bad. But we can't change our parents. We can't change, at least uh, I hope we wouldn't want to change whether or not we choose to age. Uh, that's an enormous risk factor for this disease. So I choose to live as long as I can, as well as I can. And I think most of us sort of unconsciously feel that way. Um, and then, you know, I'm not sure we can change our gender, although maybe there's a large population that wants to argue that. Uh, I mean, we can certainly t change our gender surgically and chemically, but Alzheimer's dementia is actually you're at greater risk if you're a woman than you're a man. It's probably because of hormonal effects in terms of uh, this disease. So those are things we will we'll just say we must faithfully accept, okay? But what can we change? Well, a number of things. Uh, you know, there is mounting evidence that what's good for our heart is good for our brain. Of course, what's good for our heart is hard to do, and you have to do it regularly, not spot-wise. Spot you have to exercise. You have to eat a healthy diet, uh, you have to be engaged, if you will, and we're pretty sure that that gives us a better chance in terms of uh, lessening this disease. Um, you know, we can go and this, this question I think could take a full hour, but I'll just go quickly. You certainly don't want to smoke, 
that will lower your chances of having this disease. You don't want to be either a teetotaler or an alcohol abuser. You want to be someone that maybe has a one glass of red wine a day, period. That appears to be protective. You certainly want to move. And I mean walk, exercise. You want to move every day as much as your physical health allows it. You know, we, we hear a lot about uh, mental stimulation. There is evidence that as, as we age, you know, actually normal aging, here's the good news, our vocabulary gets better. Our reasoning ability gets better, probably because we're, we're experienced combat veterans in the problems of life, okay? Um, but what doesn't get better is our recall. It gets slower, okay? Although there is some evidence that as you age, as we age, what the heck, I'm part of this cohort too, as we age, you know, if we do novel learning, you know, something as simple as take a different way to work every day, do things to stretch your brain, we're not going to add neurons, but what we're going to add is increased synapses, and that seems to be protective. And the last few things, uh, Believe in God. Be a churchgoer. That will extend your life. Believe in a purpose. That seems to have some benefit. Uh, and I think I'll just stop there because we've got other questions. I can go on and on. How do I handle getting away for a little while? He understands and agrees when I tell him, but when I return, he's upset and wonders why I left him. Oh, my. Uh, a very poignant question. Well, I think, number one, that caregiver must take breaks, must take respite. And, you know, we can get very clever here or very simple. Perhaps when they're away, another person who's almost as important to the caregiver might be a substitute. There are some caregivers that even use technology as a substitute for themselves. That Maybe they put a, on a video of uh, themselves or uh, an adult child that's maybe distantly away, and that seems to soothe the patient during the absence of the caregiver. Uh, but this is always tough uh, because, you know, each and every time it has to be redone. So I guess I just simply suggest some type of substitution, but I also will suggest that the, this is critical to the caregiver's health that they take a respite. In our facility, we've noticed residents who score low on the MMSE, but when given the clocks test, cannot draw the clock. Do you have any thoughts about this? Well, it, that's a terrific question, and I'm ashamed to say that I'm sure there's probably some evidence in existence where they correlate both of these screening measures, but I'm ashamed to say I'm not familiar with it. I'm a, a simple guy, and... Basically, what, what I, there are a number of ways to score the clocks test from simple to uh, quite elegant. I just simply say if it's impaired, if, if drawing the clock you know, uh, is impaired in any way, that suggests uh, that the patient has impairment. So I'm, I'm not surprised that patients that score low on the MMSE really struggle with the clocks, although... Uh, maybe the, the embedded thought here is that perhaps the clocks test is, is somewhat more specific than uh, the, the MMSC. They're rolling in now, and, and time is short. Is Alzheimer more prevalent in specific ethnic groups? Uh, there's, uh, again, I'm not, you guys are finding all my weak spots. This is dreadful. Uh, so this is the specialty in medicine called epidemiology. And, and certainly living here in, in wonderful San Antonio, there's, a, um, again, a ton of evidence that it looks like perhaps the Hispanic population is certainly more at risk for this disease. And is that because of uh, genetic components or is that because the Hispanic population is also more at risk for diabetes? And that seems to be an illness that accelerates this disease. So I'll just kind of leave short. These are short answers to try and finish all the questions. Dr. Weiss, speak a bit more about Lewy body disease. How is it different from other dementias? Well, uh, I'll give you the, the short one-minute answer. Lewy body dementia uh, is described as having some four very specific components. Number one, it's a much more rapidly progressive dementia with 
dramatic fluctuations in, in attention. So Alzheimer's dementia is more insidious, and uh, attention is sort of chipped away bit by bit. Lewy body dementia is much more rapid, and attention fluctuates. It's also associated with movement disorders. So that's why it's confused with Parkinson's disease, slowed movements, tremor, and such. Third component is it's associated with uh, stereotyped visual hallucinations very early in the disease where the patient says, gee, in, my, uh, in the corner of the room is a green frog. It's quite bizarre, a visual hallucination. That often brings the patient in to see the doctor. And then the fourth is there's some dramatic changes in sleep with this disease. So the, these symptoms are very different from the symptoms associated with Alzheimer's dementia. So in the, in the stretcher, the two medications that he just talked about, are they on the market right now? I, I presume that refers to Dimabond and Rember. Uh, the short answer is no. They, are, they have completed phase three clinical trial testing. They are sitting in front of the FDA awaiting uh, uh, new drug approval. And, and that process is, uh, is mysterious and obscure. Uh, um, I, I wish I could tell you how that, that actually happens, but it often takes months. Um, and, you know, I, when I say phase three trials, when we test the new compound, it, it goes like this. Uh, first off, preclinical, that's in uh, the lab and then in animals that have the disease, and we have animal models that we were able to induce Alzheimer's dementia. And then phase one are healthy normals, usually college kids that don't have the disease, and we're just testing for safety and trying to find out the first dose. Can you imagine how tricky it is to figure out what the first dose is? And then phase two are patients that have the disease and we have a rough idea of maybe one or two doses, and now we're, we're trialing the medicine to see how it works, how well it works, and how tolerable it is. And then phase three are enormous studies, lots of patients that have the disease, and we're really trying to, to get this finely tuned. So, um, <clears throat> Are there memory tests and screenings available that may give an indication of future Alzheimer's? Well, I'll refer the... the, the uh, that question back to what we talked about. Yes, there are, like I said, we, have, we currently have the mini mental status exam and the clocks test. Those have been in existence a long time. You can just Google MOCA and slums and, and they'll pop right up for you. <clears throat> what coping techniques can a caregiver use when the loved one no longer recognizes the caregiver or other family members? Well, this is a, truly a, a cruel and painful and heartbreaking event, an episode, and a repetitive event. And uh, I, I, I won't have a, a satisfactory answer here. I think it's, uh, it's accepting that this person has a disease, loving them nevertheless, and knowing what's going on here is the re result of the disease, not, not the person himself. I'll, I'll probably massacre this. What is the biblical statement? Hate the sin, but love the sinner. But that's something that the that family member has to tell themselves over and over and over again. Um, does massage help stimulate the brain to be helpful as treatment for Alzheimer's? I don't think that's been studied. At least I don't know of it being studied, maybe in the massage therapy literature. But I've got to imagine it... it <laughs> Uh, I've only had one massage in my life, and that was uh, a family member who was training to, to be a massage therapist. It seemed to help my brain. I was surprised. I felt more, more stimulated than relaxed at the end of it. How can a physician be sure that a spot on the brain is a bruise as opposed to vascular dementia? Multiple tests have been run, MRI, CT. Well, I, I, I'd like to believe that the radiologists who spend... Uh, four years in specialized training after medical school, and then usually another two years specifically in neuroradiology, that they're pretty skillful people. Um, and, you know, I, I realize that nothing tops, you know, a, a biopsy, but getting a brain biopsy is a, a whole other story. But I think that, they're, that we've reached a point in our imaging technology that they can be very, very... Uh, 
precise. And then there's a second question here. Is Aricept only prescribed for dementia? It's currently only approved by the FDA, and it's approved for mild, moderate, and severe Alzheimer's dementia, no other dementias, although they have actually trialed this disease in uh, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, it's, it's being trialed by the Department of Defense now in traumatic brain injury. Uh, um, there's actually a very small pilot project with uh, not Aricept, but uh, Namenda in our, our combat veterans that have post-traumatic stress disorder. So there are some specific illnesses where some of these medicines are being tentatively tried to see if they have benefit. And questions from Alaska with two minutes left. Um, okay. Is it true that if someone loses a sense of smell that they may have dementia? There, there, this has come up time and time again, kind of a quick in-office, uh, you know, doctors have different types of, uh, of test tubes with coffee grounds and vinegar and, and can the patient identify it. And, and periodically this comes up that patients that have early Alzheimer's disease that their sense of smell is, uh, is really absent. The trouble is there's a lot of people, myself included, as my wife will testify, that have very limited sense of smell for other reasons, and this creates false positives. So there's, there's evidence that maybe that might be an early sign, but it's not rock solid. My stepfather talks about his first wife as if she were still alive and wants to know when she will get home. He doesn't acknowledge my mother even as being a person. I'm torn between letting it go or telling him that she's been dead for 20 years, and it's my mom he should be concerned about. I've had a good relationship with him and have never lied to him. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, so I'll just tell you a personal story. My father had the illness, and uh, he was cared for here in Texas. My sister would come visit, and she would invariably mention uh, my mom, our mother, and my father would break into tears each and every time, and it would be very painful. Uh, so I asked my sister, not as a physician, but as her brother, to simply mention that mom was up north where my family's from, and that gave my dad a lot of comfort. And she would do that. I guess that's a lie, a white lie, but it provided a lot of comfort for him and a lot of comfort for us. And I can't tell you if that's good or bad. I'll just tell you that that's what we did. Uh, so uh, that's a pretty paltry suggestion, but that's the best I can do. And, and I'm a respecter of time. It's 11.30. Cease and desist. Yeah, one more. One more. Which, 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 this one? Oh, sure. Okay. Oh, okay. Do you have any insights or suggestions as to handling a loved one with dementia uh, who is exhibiting very difficult behaviors such as aggression, cursing constantly, how can an elderly spouse handle such a thing, and what would your suggestion be to her? Well, I guess uh, several things. Number one, get reinforcements, because I think that uh, my spouse knows what buttons to punch for me, and I probably know what buttons to punch for her. So despite the disease, you know, people that we love and we're intimate with, they, they know how to manipulate us. So I'd get some reinforcements. And what you'll probably notice the reinforcements doing is very patiently, very repetitively, trying to redirect or distract this patient. Um, I play every card possible. If this is a patient that was a religious person, I'd play the, you know, cursing is, a, is an offense to God's name, okay? Uh, if this is somebody who is aggressive, uh, you know, you're going to have to do what we do with... Uh, little kids who decide to, to punch or strike out. You know, you're going to have to try and verbally redirect them, verbally restrain them, uh, maybe uh, re reoccupy them. Instead of uh, hitting you, maybe they'll, they can do some small tasks. So, uh, again, uh, 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 I feel like that's a, a feeble answer, but the best I can come up with. So. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Thanks for the relief here. This is getting hot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Okay.
Everyone here who's in uh, our audience live at the Training Institute in San Antonio is going to complete a survey. And we want everyone who's watching on the uh, Internet in the webcast to also complete one. You'll see a button at the top on the uh, upper right, and it says survey. So we want you to complete the survey. Just click on it. It's going to take you less than 10 it's going to take you less than five minutes to do that. And the good thing about this test is that everyone makes 100%. Now, I actually got a question, and I think Dr. Weiss will tell me this is okay. We had someone ask if we could provide a copy of the slide presentation. May we do that? If you will email me at info at mmlearn.org, I will send you a copy of the slide presentation. We also want to thank Terry Wilson, who's in, um, I think, the Panhandle in Texas, for sending in a question. Pete McKinnon at the Bob Ross Center here in San Antonio has a group that's watching. Thank you, Pete. And Lisa's Place last time had a problem watching uh, on Nacogdoches here in San Antonio. So Rita and one of our staff members, Dayon, made that whole system work today. So thank you, Dayon, and thank you, Rita, for being so patient. Again, we want to thank the Baptist Health Foundation of San Antonio for being the sponsor of Ask the Geriatrician, and we want to thank all of our other donors, including Methodist Healthcare, the San Antonio Area Foundation, the Prior Trust, and all of our donors. Now, this is going to happen again at the end of April, on April the 28th at 10.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. It will be Dr. Weiss, and the topic will be substance abuse and older adults. If you have any questions, please uh, contact us at info at mmlearn.org or call us at area code 210-734-1211. We enjoyed being with you this morning, and we look forward to seeing you in April. Thank you very much.